Hello. In this video, we're going to take a look at solving linear Diophantine equations, and I'm going to show you a much easier way of solving these than how it's usually taught or presented in most any textbook. So before we get to that, let's just review briefly what we mean by a linear Diophantine equation. These are typically more difficult than other types of equations because we're only looking for solutions that come from the set of integers. If we have two variables, x and y, we require x and y to both be integers. Also, linear Diophantine equations means we have no higher powers on our variables or no products of variables. For example, here would be two equations which we would classify as linear equations. Here, these are two examples which would be nonlinear equations. Now, we know back from algebra, if we look at a linear equation like 2x plus 3y equals 7, we could solve that for y, maybe put it in slope-intercept form, graph the linear equation, which I've done here in red. Every point on that line is an ordered pair that makes this equation true. So when you're looking at a graph, you're really looking at a picture of the solution set. Now, this particular equation does have some ordered pairs on that line where x and y are both integers. So this linear Diophantine equation, okay, we call it a Diophantine equation if we're only looking for solutions where x and y are integers, it would have some solutions, which I have graphed there in green. Now, if it does have integer solutions, it would have an infinite number of them. But it doesn't mean that they all have integer solutions. So let's, look, let's take a look at one like this, 10x plus 15y equals 33. You first want to determine if you have solutions or not, because we don't want to waste time looking for solutions if they don't exist. So you would first consider what is your greatest common divisor of your two coefficients there on your variables. In this case, it's 5. The greatest common divisor of these two coefficients must divide the other side. Otherwise, you will not have solutions. So this was an example of one which would not have any integer solutions. So in general, if I have ax plus by equals c, the greatest common divisor of a and b must divide the other side. In fact, the smallest positive value of this linear combination is always equal to the greatest common divisor. Okay, the smallest positive value of this linear combination is always equal to the greatest common divisor. In fact, all other solutions okay, is an integer multiple of that greatest common divisor. So when we're first checking to see if it has solutions, we find the greatest common divisor of a and b. If it does not divide the other side, there are no solutions. If it does divide the other side, there'll be an infinite number of solutions. Now, if there is solutions, and if we find one, we can always find other solutions. Okay, and this is how we would do it. If I have some initial solution here, and I have my linear combination set equal to my greatest common divisor, the other solutions can be found by taking x, x will equal my initial value of x plus b, Remember, b is the coefficient with y divided by the greatest common divisor times integer multiples. k represents any integer. And other values of y can be found by taking my initial value of y minus a, a is the coefficient with x, divided by my greatest common divisor times k, where again, where k is an integer multiple. For example, let's say I have an equation 60x plus 22y equals my greatest common divisor of those two coefficients, which is 2 in this case. And let's say I have my first solution found. It's a negative 4, 11. I could find other solutions by taking x equals a negative 4, my initial value of x, plus 22, remember that's the coefficient with y, divided by my greatest common divisor, which is really just 11. And y would equal 11 minus 60, that's the coefficient with x, divided by my greatest common divisor, which is really just 30, times k. And k can be any integer. So for example, if k is 1, I could just substitute 1 in here for k, and I would have another solution. I could let k equal a negative 2. I can let any integer. So if I put a negative 2 in here for k, I have another solution. We could just keep going and find more and more solutions. Now, 
before I get to this new method, which I think once you see it, you'll probably never go back to the way you might have been taught. Okay, it's going to be much easier. But just so you really appreciate it, I want to go through just briefly of how it's typically introduced. Okay, so we'll kind of go through this quickly. But let's take a look at this equation. I have 1197x plus 312y equal to the greatest common divisor of those two coefficients. Now, let's find out what that coefficient is. We know if we set it equal to the greatest common divisor, there will always be a solution. So you might want to review the Euclidean algorithm. I'll just review it quickly here. But notice, <clears throat> I take my largest coefficient divided by the other one, so 1197 divided by 312 would go on three times with the remainder of 261. Then I bring the 312 down here and divide it by my previous remainder, 261. It goes in once, plus the remainder of 51. Then I bring 261 down here, divided by the previous remainder here, 51. It goes in five times with the remainder of 6. 51 divided by 6 goes in eight times, plus the remainder of 3. And then I bring the 6 down, divided by 3. It goes in twice with the remainder of 0. So once you get a remainder of zero, you're finished, and your previous remainder, or in other words, the last non-zero remainder, is your greatest common divisor. This is called the Euclidean algorithm. Okay. Now, what is typically done at this point then, to find our solutions to this equation, is really kind of tedious. Okay. And you'll probably find lots of videos showing you this method. What we do here, notice this equation where we have the greatest common divisor. I solve this for 3. In other words, I subtract 6 times 8, eight from both sides. Now I take the equation above it and I solve it for 6. Subtracting 51 times 5 from both sides and I substitute that in for 6. Okay, then we simplify the terms and then notice I take the next equation above that one and solve it for 51 and I here it is and I substitute it in for 51 and then we simplify that and then I take the last equation here and solve it for 261 and substitute it in there and solve and here we have our solution a negative 49 was X and Y was 188. Now, I kind of went through that quickly. You can take your time and look through this. This is not what this video is about. I'm going to show you a better way of doing this. Okay. There will be lots of videos you'll find online using this method. Okay. So here's our two solutions. Now, what I want to do is look at these quotients here. 3, 1, 5, 8, 2. Okay. Now, we're going to build a table. Notice here, 3, 1, 5, 8, 2. We might even refer to this as a table of quotients. I take my largest coefficient here, 1197, put it in the first row. Here's my next coefficient, and then this box is always the same. Okay, we might think of this as a table of quotients. Uh, it's really related to or associated with the Euclidean algorithm. It just simplifies the method. So, notice when we fill out this table now, Notice where these values are coming from. This 49 is 8 times 6 plus the previous value in that row. Okay, 8 times 6 plus 1. Okay, notice this 23 okay, is 4 times 5 plus the previous value in that row. And that's how we fill out the table. Okay, so it goes rather quickly. The interesting thing here is notice the second to last column. You should recognize those values. Those are the values that we need. Those are our solutions. Now, one may be positive, one may be negative. We haven't found our signs yet. And there is a formula to determine that, but it's really just about as easy just to use trial and error. Okay. Notice it's going to be a negative 49 times 1197 and 188 times 312. This one happens to be negative. That was the solution we found on the previous page. And that was much easier than that tedious method that we looked at. We could find other solutions just like we always do. 
Okay. And simplifying this, for example, if I substitute K in there, I could find another solution. Now, let's take a look at one more using this table. Here, notice we may have an equation that starts out where it's not equal to the greatest common divisor. In this case, it's equal to 48. We still need to take this equation and set it equal to the greatest common divisor. So we go through the Euclidean algorithm. I take 18 divided by 5. It goes in three times with the remainder of 3. Then I take 5 divided by 3. It goes in once with the remainder of 2 and so forth until we get 0. So the last non-zero remainder is our greatest common divisor. So in this case, that is 1. Now, you probably would have been able to determine that by looking at this, but we need these quotients here. Because notice those are listed across the top of our table. Now we have 18 and 5 here. This box is always the same. Okay. Notice this 7 is really 4 times 1 plus the previous value. And the second to the last column are the values that we need to make the equation true. And when we say that, that makes the equation equal to the greatest common divisor. Again, you'll have to determine which one of these may be negative. In this case, it's 18 times 2 plus 5 times a negative 7 equals 1, the greatest common divisor. So, these are the solutions that we needed to make it equal to the greatest common divisor. Our original equation was equal to 48, though. So in this case, all we need to do is multiply both sides of this equation by 48. 2 times 48 is 96. Negative 7 times 48 is negative 336. And 1 times 48 is 48, of course. And we have our two solutions that we needed. Again, we could find other solutions uh, just by taking x equal 96 plus 5. Remember that's 5 divided by the greatest common divisor, but that happens to be 1 in this case. Okay, and we could find other solutions then. Okay, so this is a much, much easier method of solving linear Diophantine equations. Now I just wanted to go through one more example because sometimes we require our solutions to be positive and only positive values because possibly in a real life problem those are the only values that make sense. For example here, how many different ways could we use $20 bills and $50 bills to make a purchase costing $630? So really this is our equation, 20x plus 50y equals uh, 630. So we need to solve this equation. Well notice we want to come up with the greatest common divisor of 20 and 15, or excuse me, 20 and 50, which is 10. So we start out by solving 20x plus 50y equals 10. Now we've already looked at how we could do that using the table. This one's easy enough. We could maybe just observe and come up with one solution, which is 3 and a negative 1. Okay. Notice 20 times 3 plus 50 times a negative 1 equals 10. And then, of course, we want to get back to our original equation, so we multiply both sides by 63. And here's our equation now. Now remember we require positive solutions because it wouldn't make any, well, positive or non-zero because it wouldn't make any sense to have negative values for x and y in this case. So now when we want to find other solutions, remember this is how we do that, okay, so 50 divided by ten, uh, 10 is really 5k, 20 divided by 10, and that's negative is negative 2k. So we require x and y to be positive. In other words, in this case, 189 plus 5k must be greater than or equal to 0. Negative 63 minus 2k must also be greater than or equal to 0. Solving both of these for k, then, that requires, the first one requires k to be greater than or equal to a negative 37. The negative, or the, the second one requires k to be less than or equal to a negative 32. So in other words, these are the positive possible values for k, and the only possible values for k. And as we substitute these six possible values in here, we find 
are possible values for x and y, for x and y are positive. So now we have the only positive solutions for x and y to this equation, and we know we have all of them. Okay. So hopefully um, you like that method. I think if you play around with that table a little bit, you'll really like it. It's much easier, it's quicker, less chance of error, and you'll probably never go back to that other method of back substitution. So um, hopefully you enjoyed this, and I will see you next time.